All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, so this is based on this uh, archive paper. I think it's called like Efficient Learning of S States with Small Number of T-Gates or something. It's joint work with Sabi, who is right here, uh, Vishnu Iyer, William Kretschmer, and I, uh, while we were all U students at UT Austin. Uh, Will's now a postdoc at Simons. I'm now at Rice, as you can see. Um, but yeah, this is while we were all students there. Um, and I assume most of you went to Srinivasan's talk, so I don't actually have to tell you what tomography is. But you know, if you weren't there, you have black box access to copies of some state. I'm going to assume a pure state in this case. Um, and the goal is just to approximate it with some classical description. And like you said, we can show it's hard. It's like an exponentially long vector. And in general, you can't even write it down in polynomial time. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm mostly going to be focusing on time complexity. Uh, Srinivasan mostly talked about sample complexity, so just keep that difference in mind. Um, so yada, 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 how to get around the barrier, pack learning, shadow tomography, things like that. Uh, he talked all about that. Um, and then the other option, like you mentioned, was to look at a specific class of states. So we have like learning algorithms. Like These are uh, time efficient even, for the most part, like for free fermion states, low degree phase states. I think you skipped over that part. Um, then stabilizer states, and I'm going to be talking more about uh, how to use this. stabilizer states right there. Okay, so again, this should mostly be review for you guys, but uh, a Clifford unitary is just anything produced by Hadamard, Phase, and CNOT gates, um, and a stabilizer state is just any state generated by a Clifford unitary on the all zero state. Um, and I mentioned that this is a restricted class of states. So naturally, this is not a universal gate set. Um, this is despite like Hadamard giving us superposition, the phase gate giving us complex phases, and C0 giving us entanglement. So we have all of these things that you would describe to quantum states, and yet it's not a universal gate set. And because of that, we have a lot of interesting applications. So you might famously see it in error correction, um, quantum key distribution, uh, like learning algorithms, like this classical shadows algorithm that we sort of briefly covered in the last talk. Uh, unitary designs, quantum money, classical simulation, blah, blah, blah. There's like tons of applications for these states. And the reason why they're used so much is because they're like intrinsically tied to these poly matrices that you have probably seen before in physics class or otherwise. Um, so I'm going to define these matrices i, x, y, and z as follows. And I'm going to define the poly group as just sort of the n-fold tensor product of these four matrices. Uh, usually you'll see like a phase associated with them to make it a group. Uh, for this talk and for convenience, I'm gonna, just going to pretend that global phase doesn't matter. And you can think of any matrix that is like equivalent up to a global phase as you know, just being the same matrix. So something that's going to be really important in this talk is this set stab of psi. So for any state psi, I'm going to define stab of psi to be the set of matrices from the polys such that psi w psi, absolute value squared, is equal to 1. So this is sort of just saying that psi is like a 1 or like a root of unity eigenvector of the poly w. And I just want you to stare at this for a little bit and convince yourself that this is not only a group, but it's an abelian group. Um, and if you don't see it, well, you're just going to have to trust me, unfortunately. But it has really, really nice structure. And this is true regardless of what psi is. Um, you should probably also verify that for like a hard random state, this is just like the identity matrix. So just to check your iteration. And the reason why stabilizer states are so interesting is that they are the only states that have stab of psi equal to 2 to the f, which is like the maximal size of an abelian group of poly matrices. And once you have stab of psi, you basically have the state. Because this is sort of like a constraint on your state. And once you have two to the n constraints, you're left with just a single state. Only one state satisfies all of these constraints simultaneously. So let me give you a sort of warm up algorithm for learning stabilizer states. This is a version given by Ashley Montanero in like 2017. And it basically goes as follows. So given stab of psi, there exists a Clifford circuit C such that if I apply C to this stabilizer state, 
I'm left with a computational basis state. So, okay, let's say I have stab of psi from like God gives it to me or some oracle or something. Then the learning algorithm is pretty simple. I just measure this computational basis state x once I've applied c. I learn x. And my classical description is just inverse of c times x, right? Because it's reversible. Um, OK, any questions about that? That should be like the baseline. If you don't get that, you're going to get lost later. OK. So the question is, how do we learn stab of psi, right? And the sort of the key idea of his algorithm was given copies of the stabilizer state phi, there exists a measurement to efficiently sample from the uniform distribution over stab of psi. So, yeah? On your previous slide, you said given stab of psi, and then some out of the random time, oh, it's squared. Like stab of psi is like a set of size two to the end. Right? How are you given it? Just the generators? Yeah, just the generators. Um, yeah, when I refer to like these things, these groups, I just mean like you're given the generators. Like the stabilizer tableau, if you're familiar with that language. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess the point only this circuit C can be computed efficiently. Um, and that's via like Aronson Gottesman style simulation, like algorithms, things like that, stabilizer tableaus. Okay. Um, so once you can sample from stab of psi, uh, then you can sort of just get roughly n of them, maybe like 2n or so. And with high probability, you will generate the entire group with the samples that you get. Um, so it's sort of like a two-step algorithm, just sample a bunch of times, and then just run this Clifford circuit, find out what the uh, computational basis state is, invert it, you're done. Okay. Um, so there are various generalizations of stabilizer states, uh, things like st low stabilizer rank states, like Srinivasan talked about, uh, low degree phase states can sort of be considered one variant of them. And then perhaps one that's really interesting, I think, is Clifford plus T states, uh, which I will define later. But um, basically the question is, can we learn any of them efficiently? Can we like sort of use Montanaro's algorithm and bootstrap it to get bigger and bigger classes of efficiently learnable states uh, from the stabilizer states? So I talked about how the Clifford gates are not universal. Um, as you likely know, if you add a single gate outside the Clifford set, you will make a universal gate set. The T gate is probably the most common of them. Um, and this is what it is. You really don't need to know much about it. Um, but what you do need to know is that the T gate sort of takes us further and further from the nice algebraic properties of stabilizer states. It sort of necessarily has to because it's a universal gate set now. Um, and something I want to focus on is that we have these like classical simulation algorithms for stabilizer states. And the runtime scales as poly n exp of k, where k is like the number of t gates. Um, and basically, can we sort of imitate that, right? Can we get learning algorithms where the learning time is poly n exp of k, where k is the number of t gates? And it turns out um, through three like sort of simultaneous results this year that you can learn any state produced by k t gates in time poly n x k, which is effectively meeting our goal. Um, and it's sort of like there's no rigorous proof at a high level, but it's like the only thing we should really expect to get unless, say, like stabilizer rank is sub exponential or something like that. Uh, that went backwards. Uh, okay, so some other results we have are we have like pseudorandom state distinguishers. Um, there's a really cool Simon's talk about that by my co-author Will. Um, with things involving stabilizer fidelity and property testing, I'm not going to define them, but if you're curious, you can just ask me later. Um, we have a follow-up work where we use single copies only. I think there was a previous question about like tomography with only single copies or non-entangled measurements. Uh, we basically get a slower and less sample efficient algorithm using only single copies, but it's pretty hairy. I don't really want to talk about it too much in this talk. Yeah. Do you need to comment on the separation between the single copy and the multi-copy case? Uh, okay, so in the single copy, in the multi-copy case, we use linear samples and n cube time. Yeah. In the single copy case, you can do it in n cube samples and n to the fifth time. 
or you can use an extra round of adaptivity and bring it to n to the fourth time. So, yeah. Uh, okay, actually, any more questions about this before I continue? Uh, can you cover on the base of the exponent of k in these results? Is it all the same? Um, it entirely depends on how good your pure state tomography algorithm is that I'll talk about later. So I believe the best known uh, results by like Brandau, Kung et al, it runs in like 16 to the n. Um, it's like 16 to the n over epsilon to the sixth or something in time complexity. Four? Four? Oh, okay. Yeah, but um, it entirely, it's, we like black box that part. It's just like run pure state tomography, the best one you have. Um, and, you know, via the sample complexity balance, this has to be exponential time, no matter what you do. Yeah. Yeah, any more questions about these results? So the time complexity I just mentioned uh, allow us to learn everything about the state? I mean, when you say learn, uh, it's just a naive question. What, what do you mean by learning yeah, that I state? mean like tomography. Like Srinivasan said, you can get the trace of every single measurement. Like you can, you can do this. I mean, assuming I guess your measurement can be written down efficiently too. But. Okay. So you know all the phase, all the off-diagonal elements. So. Yeah, yeah, you know all of that. Like we have a classical description of a state that is epsilon close to the state that you're given. Yeah. What is the link between stabilizer rank and number of TKs again? Uh, well, I mean, that's a large open question, I guess. Um, but you can trivially show that the stabilizer rank is at most exponential in the number of T-gates. Um, but we don't know much more than that, right? It's like the, I think, linear bounds, lower bounds on stabilizer rank. So it's like really bad. Um, it's like a huge open problem. But we can talk more about this later. But yeah, that's an entirely different direction of research. OK. OK. So I talked about like states with you know, a few number of T gates. Um, we only actually need to use one property of those states in our work. Um, this is sort of what separates us from other works, actually. Um, so we have this lemma or, that says that let psi be produced by Clifford gates and at most kt gates, then the size of stab of psi is going to be greater than or equal to 2 to the n minus k. So uh, basically, every time you apply a t gate, you at most have the size of this set. Um, we can actually generalize this to non T gates, so just like arbitrary non Clifford gates. And instead, you would just get a 2 to the n minus 2k. It's like a factor of 2 that's special to the T gate because it's like diagonal. Um, so, what really happens is that we just look at states such that stab of psi is large. Um, because, like I said, that's the only property that we need. Um, so, like another statement that we make, which is like the more general statement, is you can learn any state such that stab of psi is big, or two, size 2 to the n minus k, in time poly n x per k. So did that go? basically, we like sort of rework Montanaro's algorithm at a high level. So let's say that we have our assumption that stab of psi is large. Then it turns out that learning stab of psi is, again, enough to efficiently learn our state. So you might have seen this before in a slightly, like, I guess, previous slide. But given stab of psi, there exists a Clifford circuit such that we can map it to a computational basis state and some unknown state phi here that's just like k qubits. Um, and basically, the idea is, OK, we don't really know what phi is, but we can learn what x is, just measuring the computational basis state again. And then we can just run brute force pure state tomography on phi. So yeah, it's going to be inefficient, but if k is small, like say log n, then this is still a polynomial time algorithm, right? So this is where like the x with k comes in to play, basically. That's like the only part where it comes in, is we're just running pure state tomography on like a logarithmic number of qubits. Um, and we just, again, we output c dagger times x and our like approximation of phi. Uh, and with that, you know, okay, again, C can be computed efficiently and squared, uh, linear algebra stuff, yeah. Can you provide any intuition as to why this separation is possible? I, I don't see it from a high level. Um, yeah, so 
the reason I call it a compression scheme is that we basically map stab of psi, it's like some group, right? We map it to only the i and z polys on the first set of qubits. And once you've done that, once, like, once you have your qubits stabilized by those i's and z polys, it has to be a computational basis state. And that's all you need. We like apply a Clifford circuit such that the like stab of psi with like C applied to it is now this I's and Z polys on the first set of qubits. Yeah. Um, so this is actually like this is more or less a, like a feature of quantum error correction actually that you can like take some syndrome measurement and you can like push it onto some set of qubits. Um, so this is like not necessarily our technical contribution. Um, maybe the only contribution is we observe that you could run pure state tomography here. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so you start from this step, right, which is a nice group, as you said. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, if you were to have knowledge about some cosets in that group, would that improve the phi? Right, I mean, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah which, I mean, oh, it, it looks like, okay, I mean, now you have to do this price, so if you, if you want to do faster, Light on your <laughs> then then maybe you have to know more information then it can be really efficient. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Like that is an open question actually. Um, can you use more information about phi? Right now we assume none um, to get like better learning algorithms tailored to just Clifford and T gates. Um, right now our algorithm though is like optimal for just states that have this property. And States produced by log and T gates just happen to be a part of that set. But I'm sorry to. Uh, there's a group, right? Yeah. So just knowing the cardinality of the group is maybe very little information about. It's not just the cardinality. It's like you also have to have the generators itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We we. we if like, you were to have more knowledge, maybe you know some conjugacy classes of that group or something. Yeah, yeah, for sure, but um, it's unclear necessarily how to get them, I guess. Yeah. Just from like copies of the state, yeah. Well, I suspect this, do you think you can get better than, maybe are you, is there lower bounds as well that we know, or? Uh, there aren't any like strict lower bounds on this. On the poly of n and x both get, like, I'm wondering like if knowing phi would give you a better algorithm or you couldn't have for it in the first place? Um, if you're specifically looking for like Clifford plus log and T gates, you could, almost surely get a better algorithm, I think. But if your state, so like states that have this property are like, you know, X tensor, like a hard random state, and you just can't expect to do better than that. So the C is Clifford. Yeah, C is Clifford, right? Clifford, yeah. And uh, there is no T gates. No T gates in it, yeah. Yeah, we've like pushed all of the T gate action into these like last few qubits. We make no assumptions about what is happening on those qubits, and we just run pure state tomography. Sure. Sure. Follow up to uh, Srinivasan's question. You said you think you can do better if for this uh, for KT gate, the T state. Yeah, if you use KT gates, you mean better by just the uh, coefficient in the exponent of K can be better, or the exponential function can be made a better function? Like you can go sub exponential in K or something. Oh, I don't. I don't know if we can do sub exponential in K. Um, I have no proof of that. But uh, I definitely think you can get the exponent better, oh. yeah, like the, the, the constant. Instead of like, what, 4 to the n, 16 to the n, whatever, you could get it 2 to the n, maybe. So, so, so they are direct product states, right? So this is completely separable. Yeah, 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 yeah. OK. And so you mentioned that phi might be a hard random state. Is that uh, something that you can prove, that it is actually like a hard random state? No, 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 no. I'm not saying it is hard random. I'm saying we can even learn a state that is x tensor hard random. Like those are states that have this property, and we can we can still learn them, um, and it's like a superset of the states that I, in my title, I said I would learn. Matthias, um, follow up question on that because I think I'm not quite getting it. So the, the state psi mm -hmm. is Clifford plus k t gates, mm -hmm. so that should have like a limited circuit complexity to be implemented, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're applying a Clifford to it, which also has a limited circuit complexity. Mm -hmm. And 
So the state you get out also has a limited circuit complexity, but you're, you're saying that relative to the k qubits, it could be exponentially complex and therefore all random on the k qubits. Oh, uh, so I'm, what I'm saying is that imagine if instead of a state produced by Clifford circuits plus like log number of t gates, let me, let's say I just give you a computational basis state, tensor har random state, and then there's like a random Clifford circuit on that. Oh, okay, I get it. I can still learn those states. Okay. So we like learn a, technically like a much broader class, and states produced by log and t gates are just like a zero measure of that set. Yeah. So if you try to learn states with more than log and t gates using this strategy, um, it's going to fail because, simply because you can't compute c in, in reasonable time, right? No, no, it's not c. C is just stays, actually c gets faster. It's the, this part becomes like, like, you know, the runtime is like x with k. And as the t gates goes up, k goes up, right? So once k is like beyond log n, say like, you know, square root n is going to run exponential in square root n. And that's just too long. Right. No. Yeah. So that's, that's the barrier is basically we have this pure state tomography barrier because we make no assumptions about phi. So yeah, if you want to get past this like log n barrier using a similar technique, you're going to have to make some assumptions about phi. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to sort of uh, give a, like a super high level idea of the algorithm. It's basically, let's say you know stab of psi um, from you know, some oracle or something. Then you find a C such that you, know, you get this product state structure. You measure the first register to learn x. You perform pure state tomography. And then you output C dagger x and then your approximation. All right, so just restating what I said earlier. All right, but the question is, how do we find stab of psi to complete the algorithm? Um, okay, and for that, I'm going to have to introduce a bit of notation. So I'm going to define this function called p psi of a poly matrix, and it's just the scale factor one over two to the n times uh, psi w psi squared. And because you know w is like Hermitian, I don't need an absolute value, but in principle, you would have it there. So it's just like the, ups, the expectation squared divided by some scale factor. And um, I won't prove it to you, but it turns out this is actually a distribution. in the fact that they're all bigger than 0, this is obvious by the square, but uh, they sum to 1. And this was shown by Montanaro. And it turns out that we can sample not from p psi, but from p psi convolved with itself. And what that means is, let's say I take p psi, it's going to be some poly string. And then I sample another string from p psi. And then I multiply those polys together. And I output that. So we can't, to the best of our knowledge, sample from p psi. But we can from q psi via this Bell difference sampling technique. Um, all you really need to know from this is that it's like a two copy measurement. Um, and uh, it's going to be a little complicated to work with q psi. So I'm actually going to just pretend that we can sample from p psi. All the intuition follows, just the analysis gets hairier. And I just don't want to you know, make, that, make you go through that. I am really struggling with this. OK. So the really important part of our work is actually this one duality theorem, where we say, you know, given a subgroup G of the poly matrices, G can now be just any arbitrary group that if I have some sum of p psi of these from this group, that up to some like pro constant of proportionality, that it's equal to the sum of this g perp, which is like some dual space. Um, and what that g perp is is generally known as the commutant. So let's say g perp is the set of poly matrices that commutes with all of g. So if I take a random element from g perp, or like the commutant of g. I just need it to commute with every single element of G. And the reason why I call it a dual uh, space or dual group is that the commutant of the commutant is equal to itself. So you can sort of think of this as the sum on this group is equal to this proportionality here. And then you can sort of move into this dual space and get like a similar sum. OK, any questions about this before like, we move on? It's sort G, of a... G perp lies outside G or is it? Hmm? G perp is out, a separate thing? Uh, outside G or is it inside G? 
Uh, it depends. So there are certain sets where G perp is uh, strictly a superset of G. That's uh, known as maybe like an isotropic group or whatever. But in general, they're like it's like a one-to-one, -one, uh, like a bijection, but they could be pretty different from each other, depending on like how nice or not nice G is. Okay, so one really cool corollary of uh, this uh, duality theorem is that the support of P psi lies in the commutant of stab of psi. So how do we prove that? Um, okay, so by our duality theorem, let's say we have the sum over uh, stab of psi over here. And by the duality theorem, we have this proportionality constant here. It's going to be equal to the sum over stab of psi perp, or the commutant of stab of psi. Okay, but let's look at another definition, like way of computing this. So if I start with stab of psi, um, what is the definition of stab of psi? Well, it's the things where psi w psi squared over two to the n, or like psi w psi squared is equal to one. Like if I go, wow, this is. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, it's, it's the part where this expectation value is equal to one. So, it turns out that you can see it's equal to the cardinality of stab to psi divided by two to the n. So we have this guy and this guy, they're equal to each other. These factors are the same. It remains that this is equal to one. And if some summation over a group or some set is equal to one, that means it contains the support of that distribution. So at a high level, what that means is that if I sample from P psi, then no matter what, it will commute with stab of psi, no matter what I do. And this sort of gives us a lot of power. So let's say, for instance, my algorithm is draw like linear number of samples from P psi, call them W1 through WM, and then I compute the commutant of my samples. It should be the case that this is like a good approximation of stab of psi. Um, I will say that you know, computing the commutant can be done in like O of n cubed. It's like some Gaussian elimination thing. And basically, once you do that, you pretend that stab of psi hat is stab of psi, and you run the compression scheme that we talked about before with the Clifford circuit. And you know, for most cases, this, this is the algorithm. Um, this will work with pretty well. Yeah. Can you say more, like how to do compute the commutant in cubic time? Um, so it's, it has to do with this symplectic inner product. Um, and you can just set it up as like, it's like the null space of some matrix and then uh, something like that. So that's how it's like Gaussian elimination gets involved. Um, have you thought about uh, how robust this scheme is to like possibly to, to some kind of like poly noise? Because I can imagine that. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's like from a totally different group. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty bad to noise. Um, I mean, stabilizer states are like a generalization of parities in some sense, right? Like you know, parity check codes or become stabilizer codes and things like that in the quantum world. So they're just inherently not robust to noise because they're highly algebraic. Yeah. What's the sense of the approximation? You said hat stab slide is an approximation to stab slide. Uh, I'm going to get into that later, but I just want to give you the intuition behind the algorithm. Yeah. Okay. So if you take nothing away from this talk, you should just take away this. This is like the algorithm at an intuitive level. Just pretend that stab of psi actually gives you stab. Uh, stab of psi hat is actually stab of psi. It won't actually be the case in practice, but you know, that's what you should intuitively think. Okay. So as Robin mentioned, we cannot always learn the support of p psi exactly. And if we don't, what happens is that if we get some group that doesn't cover the support, which is stab of psi, as I showed earlier, then g perp will necessarily be a group that's bigger than stab of psi. So we're going to learn some extra elements, basically, that we don't want. Uh, and the solution is, in fact, that just learning almost all of the support is still sufficient to do learning. 
And what I mean by that is, let's say that g of stab of psi, so that, pretend g is like the thing that we ended up sampling. So it's just like some imperfect uh, approximation of the support of our distribution p psi. And let's say that you know, it captures a 1 minus epsilon squared fraction of the distribution. Then we can actually show that psi is epsilon close to a state phi such that sab of phi is equal to g perp. So basically, let's say we, we do this task, we get this g that's like an approximation, then we can show that we can basically just pretend that we have phi instead, where phi actually is, like, does have the property that we thought it would. Um, and, you know, basically some turnoff bounds, Huffing's inequality, et cetera, you can show that learning such a subgroup with, like, this many samples, so uh, it requires, like, n over epsilon squared samples, basically. So you just sample a bunch of times, and with high probability, you'll get this condition. Okay. So basically, our reworked algorithm is we're going to draw, like, m equals o of n over epsilon squared samples now. So we have like an epsilon dependence. Uh, again, we compute the commutant. Um, and then we're going to apply a c such that c of psi is approximately equal to x times phi. Um, and we, we kind of have to do some other stuff to keep things like kosher, I guess. Um, because it's an approximation, we have to do some like post selection to make sure things are still pure. Uh, otherwise, we'd have to run like full state, like mixed state tomography. And this just gives us some, speed up some runtime. But the high level is that we, uh, we s measure like this first register a bunch of times. Uh, because it's an approximation, we're not guaranteed the first try gives us x. So we just do it a bunch of times, take a majority. Um, and then we, again, approximate phi. And this is still like a good approximation. Um, so I digress and say that the next few slides are going to be pretty technical, um, just to explain why this works. So uh, try and bear with me, but I think like all of the intuition that you really need to know is covered by this algorithm and like the previous version. So if you don't take anything away from the next few slides, I think that's perfectly okay. Uh, <laughs> is this a threat? <laughs> No, no, no. I would actually love if you took something away from this. Uh, I think it's pretty cool math, but you may disagree. Uh, okay, so again, just to re reiterate our goal, where we want to show that this condition is true. And another way of saying that is, okay, we can always decompose our state as follows. So like C dagger times like a summation over a computational base state and then tensor some arbitrary state. Like this is, you can always do this, right? This is just like a decomposition in the computational basis, more or less. And the goal that we want to show is that the largest alpha sub x squared, like the largest amplitude, is bigger than one over minus epsilon squared. Does everyone see why this condition proves this condition? Or does anyone have questions about that? It's basically saying that we are, this, these quantities are almost entirely concentrated on one alpha x. If one of these alpha x's is just like, a, you know, a rooted unity, then it is exactly a product state. And if it's mostly on one alpha x, then we're like approximately close to a product state, right? So that's the high level goal. And so before I get onto the next slide, if you have a state that is approximately a computational basis state, how do you learn what it is? This is like not a trick question. So like, what, what is like the simplest algorithm you can do? Sample measure. Both times. Measure it. Too. Yeah, measure in the computational based state. You, don't, you can't just do it once, right? Because you might fail. But if you measure a bunch of times, you're pretty likely to get the thing you want, assuming it's actually close to a product, to a computational basis state. And we can sort of quantify this in terms of the collision probability. So uh, for notation, I'm going to define this z, cal z of t. Um, I'm just going to keep it up there the whole time so you can reference it. Um, it's just like, you know, as I said before, poly i and z is on the first qubits. And this is sort of related to that compression scheme I talked about before. Um, so one way of writing the collision probability, uh, which is like 
what is the probability if I sample twice in the computational basis that I get the same string? So this is sort of one way of writing the collision probability, right? It's like, what is the probability I get x, and then the probability I get x again, conditional on having x before. And uh, another way of writing it is like these, like, you know, partial traces where I just only want to get x, but twice um, on two copies of psi, right? This is what we do all the time in quantum. And basically, by some Boolean Fourier analysis magic, it turns out that this is equal to uh, this sum over p psi. So somehow p psi is exactly calculating the collision probability of like, you know, the sum has to be over this specific group that I've, you know, defined up here, but it's like exactly characterizing the collision probability. Um, so this is like an a to the fourth. We, uh, we care about max of alpha x squared. Uh, so how do we relate the quantities? Well, okay, let's take max of alpha x squared and let's just multiply it by one. You know, same quantity. And it turns out because alpha of x are a distribution, like the amplitudes sum to one when squared, we can just rewrite that as max of alpha x times the sum of the amplitudes. Right? Nothing fancy there. And from here, you but can just. The squares of the distribution. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The squares are here, right? And once you've done that, it should be pretty easy to see that this is lower bounded by the sum of the, like, the uh, amplitudes to the fourth power. I can just like replace this, move it here, and it's going to be strictly bigger than using a smaller amplitude here. Everyone follow that? So we're basically saying that the maximum amplitude is exactly equal to this specific sum of these p psi values, uh, times some constant of proportionality again. Okay. So how do we relate that to our state and our learning algorithm? Well, okay, let's just say we get this cool special case and the G that we sample happens to have the property that the commutant of it is this group, that we, the special case that we care about. Um, and let's just say that we've done a good job of sampling and we've captured a large fraction of the probability mass. Well, using our duality theorem again, we can relate it to the sum over G perp. And because G perp happens to be this Z to the N minus L, um, if you work, work through the math, you end up with this quantity right here, which we've seen before. Uh, and we can therefore uh, upper bound it by max of alpha X squared. Okay, so this tells me that if I happen to sample a G that happens to have this condition, then we're done. But what does that tell me about you know, arbitrary states. It's like extremely unlikely that G will have this property. Um, and that's really where the Clifford circuit comes into play. So, okay, yeah, so we can see that psi is close to the state because of this is really large. All okay. right, so yeah, this is where the Clifford circuit comes into play. And we say that if G is such that the sum is bigger than three fourths, um, then there exists a Clifford circuit that maps G perp to our special case. So we're going to force our special case to happen. Um, and just for like mathematical succinctness or and rigorousness, once you map, once you apply C, you don't change the actual value of the sum. Um, this is like pretty easy to see. It's like more or less the difference between the Schrodinger picture and the Heisenberg picture. Um, but basically we can force G to be uh, this Cal Z to the N minus L, which is our special case. Um, the three-fourths you might be curious about. Um, I, I actually think it's a really cool proof, but I can't get into it right now. It involves like uncertainty principles and things like that. But um, it basically, we need it to just be such that this, um, these groups like share the same properties. Because you can't map a group that has a different property. Like, I'm being very vague here, but we need it to have the same property as this special case. And if they don't have the same property, then we're just doomed to begin with. Okay, any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, in our proof, it's a strict inequality. Um, I'd be curious if you could reduce it, but this is the best that we know how to do.
Okay. Are people actually following this? I'd actually be really amazed if people are. <laughs> um, no, no, okay. I'm apparently better than I thought. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm basically going to give you now the algorithm, but with a play-by-play -play of what's happening underneath the hood. So let epsilon be a quantity from zero to one. And like I said, I'm gonna draw O of N over epsilon squared samples from P psi. Um, and so basically we're gonna, if we do this, then we can show that the sum of the P psi, like we've captured a one minus epsilon squared over four percentage of the probability mass. This four is basically because of this three-fourths right here. Uh, we just need it such that uh, for whatever value of epsilon you choose, this is still bigger than three-fourths, okay? And then we're gonna compute uh, G perp, or like G commutant. Uh, and as I said, we're gonna get some superset of the state that we, or the set that we really care about, which is stab aside. And then we're going to apply our C such that uh, we sort of forced it to be our special case. Um, and basically what happens is that we get a C psi is equal to this like, you know, product structure that we saw before, where one of these alpha x's is going to be really, really large. That's the thing that we tried to prove a couple slides ago. So this is like almost approximately a product state, but we have like some small alpha values that are preventing us from being actually a product state. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure the first register of C psi to learn what X max is. And because of our previous result, the probability of this happening is like bigger than three fourths. So we only need like, you know, 10 samples or so to figure out what X max is. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna post select on getting X max. So we had C psi is equal to this state. Once we post select, we're just gonna get x max times some phi on the end, which is some unknown state. And once we've done this, once we've done this post-selection, we've only changed our state by about epsilon over two in trace distance. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna run pure state tomography on this phi register to about ep accuracy epsilon over two. And because the trace distance is a metric, we can use the triangle inequality to show that the total trace distance between this C psi and this like phi hat is about epsilon. So this is where we get our epsilon approximation and trace distance. And then finally, we output C dagger x max phi hat and Clifford unitar or unitaries in general preserve trace distance. So epsilon remains. And uh, that's the algorithm. Any questions about that? So again, you need the three fourths so that post-selection is not killing you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, because if you need to do post-selection and state tomography, that would be multiplicative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it, it, that like three-fourths uh, comes in clutch in many different aspects. But uh, the, the reason why we choose specifically three-fourths is because of that, pre, or specifically uh, this like epsilon, one minus epsilon squared over four is because of that three fourths. It so could have the, the, the epsilon over two in the next slide is the square of this epsilon squared. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, once it's just the, the, the weight of the other complement. Yeah, once you, basically this is like the fidelity yeah, difference, yeah, and then when you go to trace distance. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? What's the success probability for that post selection? Uh, it's three fourths, yeah. at least three fourths. All right. Okay, so let me just now give you some open problems. Um, so the best known lower bounds for this problem are based on actually Yen's work with the quantum homeopathy. Um, so basically we know that if you use uh, K T gates, it should produce like a fourth root K unitary design. So you can't expect to learn that. Um, but that's really all we know. Um, obviously, if you can improve their result in some fashion, you can get better results. But this is like really bad. Like this isn't even linear in K. And our algorithms are exponential in K. So um, I'd be curious if there's any algorithms that, uh, or like any 
lower bounds that can beat this fourth root k uh, bound, which is nowhere close to where it should be. Um, and then another thing is that you might notice that. But do you have any indication where the, the, the upper and lower bounds don't match at all, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I really don't know. Um, I, my guess is that the upper bound is tight and the lower bound is not tight, but you, you just can't use unitary designs because it's just. And like the unitary design is like an information theoretic proof. So ideally you would use like a computational theoretic lower bound for this. Um, another thing is that the output of our state uh, is not necessarily produced by log n t gates. It could be produced by as many as like poly n t gates because uh, we just sort of view phi as like an arbitrary quantum state on k qubits. So once you like do pure state tomography, you get some approximation that doesn't necessarily respect the fact that it's produced by log n t gates. So um, any work on that would be uh, pretty interesting. Um, and that's about it. Uh, thank you. <laughs>